feed your head, engage your brain, and enter the mind's eye, an auditorium of audacity. I'm your host, DJ BJ Turnov, and you're listening to Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio. We are just a few short months away from the 30th anniversary of an event that not only changed everything for one family, but might change everything we know about forensics in the criminal justice system. April 1989, three small children perished in a Los Angeles apartment fire. Their mother, Joanne Parks, escaped unharmed, sole witness, and the only survivor. Authorities first believed that this was a tragic accident, but quickly changed gears and put the blame on Parks, saying that she set the fire and even went as far as barricading her own four-year-old son in a closet. Parks was ultimately convicted on the power of forensic science, sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, and remains in prison to this very day. Not so fast. It's not really that open and close. Particularly those who believe that are the lawyers at the California Innocence Project who argue that this is a wrongful conviction of an innocent mother. And that's premised on that in the years since that conviction, a forensics revolution has occurred, possibly calling the previous school of thought completely into question. The Parks case has been reopened, it's being reinvestigated, and is currently the subject of an intense legal battle. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Edward Humes, he joins the mind's eye tonight. Not only did he work with the California Innocence Project when the case first came on their table, but he is the author of a brand new book called Burned, A Story of Murder and the Crime That Wasn't. That book and this episode tonight is going to examine the Joanne Parks case and many others. And by the end, you'll realize whether Joanne Parks is a monstrous killer or an innocent mother. Find out when The Mind's Eye returns on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio. The Mind's Eye is back on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio. FYI, all of my Stitcher Radio subscribers get first crack on all of my episodes right after they air, before YouTube, before iTunes, before anything. Just subscribe to The Mind's Eye on Stitcher Radio. Before we bring on Edward Humes, who's going to talk about the case of Joanne Parks and whether she should be exonerated, I'm sure he might be fascinated in an article I just put up. Uh, It's about the justice system and how it possibly might be going backwards in the pursuit of convictions and ignoring what many would consider good science. The article talks about how forensic techniques like bite mark comparisons and blood spatter analysis are now considered by many researchers to be scientifically dubious and, and possibly responsible for dozens of wrongful convictions. Go take a peek right now on that one and other true crime-related articles uh, on our Twitter and Facebook handles, at Mind's Eye Show. Don't worry if you get lost. Just go to themindseyemedia.com where you can get the links about everything I just talked about. Again, themindseyemedia.com. No more of this pretrial, this op- these opening statements. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Edward Humes, he's going to deliberate the verdict on Joanne Parks based on his book, Burned, A Story of Murder, and The Crime That Wasn't, all when The Mind's Eye on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio resumes. We're back on The Mind's Eye, and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Edward Humes joins us now. His previous books include Garbology, Mississippi Mud, and the Penn Award winning No Matter How Loud I Shout. Tonight, we're talking a whole nother animal. Mr. Humes, thank you for putting some time aside for The Mind's Eye. You're very welcome. And of course, uh, first, you know, big congratulations on the Pulitzer Prize. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm sure you get congratulated a lot for that. Uh, and after you, uh, won- it never gets old. So. <laughs> I, I bet. Um, and after you won, did did you start making people call you like a funny nickname, like Double P, or you know, just start walking around <laughs> with a lot of a lot of swag, you know? Uh, yeah. No, oddly enough, it didn't seem to get me, you know, free parking or anything. So. Oh, geez. There okay. Well, I know my head would have grown, but, uh, you know, thankfully for modest people like you around here. (laughs) Uh, But, uh, you know, let's get serious. And, um, you know, you've explored and you've explored crime and and murder in previous books. But 
For this newest one, it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum and in, in, in quite probably an untrue crime. And we're talking about Burned, uh, a story of murder and the crime that wasn't. It's been almost 30 years since this tragic event. Uh, paint the scene for us a little bit, for our listeners. What happened on April 9th, 1989? Well, the... Uh... You know, the story really begins with that that evening it was the end of a heat wave in Los Angeles. Um, the weather had finally broken, and people could actually sleep. And um, Joanne Parks was alone at home with her kids, her three children, ages four, two, and one. Her husband worked a night shift at a dairy plant. He was away. And she had put the kids to bed early and turned in herself and awoke sometime around midnight or just after to the sound of one of her children screaming and she opened up the door from her bedroom and uh, which opened on a hallway and she was met by a wall of flame and smoke as she would later tell the police uh, that she could not get through and um, she was driven back by that she said that she tried to use the telephone extension in her the landline in her bedroom but it wasn't working and she ran to the house in front of her hers um, that shared the same lot that her uh, house actually a 500 square foot apartment was a converted garage where she and the, and the family lived she went to the main house up front banged on the door uh, and the couple there uh, called 911 and summoned uh, the first responders and then the gentleman who lived there, Mr. Robeson, tried to uh, enter the house and rescue the kids, but he too was driven back by the flames. What happened next um, is what the dispute is all about because the house was almost completely consumed by fire and fire is the one when, when it's deliberately set, it's the one criminal act that um, sort of self-destructs the evidence of, of how it occurred. The longer the, and hotter the fire burns, the less evidence uh, is left behind to figure out what happened. And this was a very powerful, quick-moving, intensely hot fire in which a phenomenon called flashover occurred, uh, in which everything in a given room combusts. Uh, it's not exactly an explosion, but it is explosive, and it's usually a fatal event for anyone who's in the room, even firefighters in all their gear. Uh, and um, that made this a very difficult fire scene to investigate later. Uh, the children were found by firefighters when they extinguished the flames. They had died of smoke inhalation and were badly burned. The... Um, Initial feeling was it was an accidental or electrical fire, but uh, some later investigation led investigators to conclude that the fire had been deliberately set uh, by a sabotaged wire, an extension cord, and that one of the children had been uh, barricaded inside a closet so he could not escape, the eldest one, the four-year-old. So he could not escape the flames. And that evidence was used to convict Joanne Parks, the mother of murder, three counts. And she has been in prison ever since the fire, since, since her trial in 1992. And that's uh, 30 years later now. And it's a, uh, how did you initially hear about Joanne Parks in this, in, and what's going on with her? Well, I first learned about the case because I had, had decided I wanted to learn more about the work of the California Innocence Project, which is one of a number of such organizations around the country whose entire, it's a law practice, this one attached to a, a law school in, in San Diego, uh, whose mission is to investigate possible wrongful convictions. And if there's there's merit in that case from, from their point of view to, to take those individuals on who've been in prison for major crimes and attempt to reopen the case and uh, win a new trial or an outright uh, declaration of, of innocence. And that's, uh, I find that process fascinating because it's, it's a rare kind of check on a, on a justice system that's, 
that uh, is really bad at finding, identifying, and admitting when it's made a mistake. Uh, and that's that's the Innocence Project's around the country's purpose is to find those mistakes and prove them and, and remedy them. Joanne Parks was just one of the cases they happened to be bringing forward at the time while I was, was visiting and I found it fascinating because it was a, it was a huge and monstrous crime at the time. It was widely covered in the press and um, this monstrous mother who killed her own children for, for no good reason. Uh, and uh, now here was the Innocence Project saying, well, you know, here's the problem. When they took her to trial, the arson investigators, the supposed experts, said that there there was no flash over in that fire and that therefore they could read the fire patterns left behind like a book. And it was very clear to them that the fire was arson, that it had been a, a, a deliberate act by, uh, by Joanne because there was nobody else at home at the time that could do it. And uh, they made a very compelling and strong arguments uh, that they knew best. Uh, and the problem is that they were wrong. A flashover did occur, and that means all the complications that that extremely intense fire can cause uh, were in play, and yet the jury never heard about that. And, and those complications are, for one thing, it masks the true area of origin of a fire and creates false trails, Trace false signs that more than that fires were set in more than one location, which the investigators had concluded happened in uh, the Parks fire, and it creates other indications of arson that can can fool or, or cloud uh, the investigators' perceptions of of whether something is truly suspicious or just an artifact of this intense kind of burning, and none of that was brought before the the jury that convicted her and. Innocence Project argued that had the jury known, had the experts been more uh, expressed more uncertainty than they did when they testified against her, uh, the outcome could have been different. Why, why didn't they express so much uncertainty when, as you alluded, that fire investigation is and arson is very difficult to determine whether it was arson or not? Part of it was the time. Uh, fires in 1989... Um, were investigated with a certain set of, of uh, beliefs, and, uh, of indicators of arson, um, indicators of when, for instance, uh, gasoline was used in a fire or when, where fires started and how. Uh, all of those ideas about how we understand um, that happens in a fire had been handed down for generations of firefighters as the collected wisdom of of arson investigation, none of which actually had any scientific research or anything else behind it. And after the early 1990s, some of that research started happening and uh, fire scientists realized that a lot of the guidelines they'd been using were all wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more myth and, and, and uh, guesswork than actual hard science. There began to be... Uh, uh, cases that were being rethought and overturned because of the kind of erroneous beliefs that were used to, to convict people or, you know, in more mundane cases where people don't die to deny them insurance coverage. Oh, well, that fire is suspicious. So now we're talking about thousands and thousands of cases that were uh, litigated and, and people's lives were affected and sometimes ruined or they were imprisoned um, based on what amounted to junk science. I don't know if the Innocence Projects has this. I think you said that there might be hundreds or, or thousands of innocent people behind uh, prison. But in cases similar to Joanne, how many people do you think are, are still behind, you know, are, are in a similar situation uh, as her? Are there thousands of people, you know, because of the lack of a fire uh, knowledge at the time? Are there still thousands of people in jail, in prison? I don't think anybody knows what that number might be. Um, there's no way to. Uh, there's no way to really know. Um, what I tried to look at is the uh, is the frequency with which bad forensic science in general has um, has contributed to to exonerations of 
uh, of people that, who had been in prison for very serious crimes. Um, and that wouldn't just be for arson, but you know, the use of any kind of scientific expert or forensic expert to to support a, a conviction in a major crime. I'm sure for most of most of your listeners know there's you practically read about an exoneration of uh, some kind every day almost um, because of the work of the Innocence Projects around the country. It's become a much more common occurrence than it used to be. Um, the justice system used to think, oh, we, you know, our error rate is like next to zero. And now there's been thousands of people in recent years who've been set free from very long sentences or sometimes death sentences because of various problems with ha- how the cases were brought against them. And about a fourth of those, of the something like, uh, I think it's 25 or 2,600 cases now in the last 20 years, about a fourth of those are because of bad forensics, uh, because of using things that appeared to be scientific uh, but turned out not to be. And that would include incorrect ideas about what causes fires. It would include um, bite mark experts who say they can tell the, if someone's teeth match a bite mark on a, on a crime victim. And that was that, the uh, that was the I think if I'm recalling right from the book that was the case of Bill Richards. Yes. So those kinds, of, you know, sometimes hair and fiber evidence, some kinds, some types of ballistics evidence, all of which is, have been used to send people to prison or send people to death and had been presented with great certainty and an aura of scientific uh, backing. And it turned out that a lot of this evidence has been highly problematic uh, or and sometimes just flat out wrong. So we know that there's been hundreds of cases like that involving murder convictions. The assumption is that there's many more less serious cases in which this kind of uh, problematic evidence is disused, but it's it's almost impossible to determine how many. And, and you mentioned that we, we have made so many amazing strides with, you know, criminal forensics and just to play a little devil's advocate, or not devil's advocate, just to raise a point, do you think it's, you know, I've heard a lot of issues now that if lawyer, you know, in modern times that if you don't have any DNA or forensics um, evidence, it's almost impossible to even get a guilty now where it's almost the opposite of what happened to Joanne on some level. Well, uh... Have you, have you, have, <laughs> I, you know, I've heard of that, you know, if you don't have that, that smoking gun, that fingerprint, or, you know, that DNA, then you're pretty much done. You know, you can't, you may not be able to get it. It's very difficult. It, not true a, in, that, in your experiences? That's not true? Well, there's a couple, there's a couple parts to that um, question. So first of all, I, I, um, some forensic sciences are... are more convincing and more vetted and more have more scientific backing uh, than others. DNA evidence, for instance, has been is the one. If you look at all the range of forensic sciences that are that are used in, by the justice system, fingerprinting, uh, uh, hair and fiber analysis, uh, fire science, anything that involves the CSI. Uh, kind of uh, uh, dramatic solving of crimes with science that we're familiar from the you know the very popular TV shows that depict that. Um, of all of those, the one that really emerged from the world of science and has been thoroughly researched and error tested is DNA. That's really solid stuff. And and when someone is either convicted on the basis of a DNA match to crime scene evidence or exonerated because they're excluded from uh, something which happens you know which dna has science has been responsible for doing many times as well uh it's it's a fairly confident result uh, from from that and we we understand the science behind those comparisons and the statistical frequency of different dna sequences all of that has been uh, peer-reviewed and um, validated and so those kinds of outcomes are are, are well supported and but the irony is this this greatest of forensic sciences is is responsible for showing that a lot of the other forensic sciences kind of suck because uh, there's been many convictions in which uh, bite mark evidence, uh, in which um, comparisons of bullet fragments, uh, shoe print comparisons, all these kinds of matching that for which you you can find an expert to come into tort and swear that because of these different scientific techniques that I've used, I can you know, absolutely say this is a match to the, the killer shoes match this crime scene. Uh, 
there's no science behind any of that. Yeah. No validation, no peer review, no research how you know how often they get it right and how often they get it wrong. Uh, it's just they're just <laughs> coming in and expressing an opinion, and uh, and it can be very convincing if the witness is good. But there's this this uh, veneer of science that they put on it is bogus. These forensic sciences have very little science in them, yeah. and. <laughs> DNA has and DNA is, is comparisons have helped prove that to be the case, and really has led to a kind of a soul searching within the justice system um, because of it, and because the uh, National Academy of Sciences came out with a report in 2009 that say, hey, you know, there's a lot of people being convicted wrongly because our older forensic sciences are not scientific, and we need to do something about that. And in the case of Joanne Parks, that doesn't seem to apply because even when presented, the old, you know, interpreters of it still stuck by their old opinion. So, and why why did they still stick by their old opinion, opinion when presented with this new evidence? Well, and that's the second part of this problem. Um, uh, there is no DNA evidence to countermand the uh, the old forensics that were used in this case. The fire destroys everything. There's no, uh, you know, there's no DNA comparison to come and say, "Aha, she definitely did it," or "Aha, she's definitely innocent." Um, so what you're left with is this house that's that's burned to a crisp and trying to interpret the burn pattern show about where the fire started, uh, about how it started, about whether or not the closet was really. Uh, barricaded that, that the little boy was trapped in or not uh, and there were experts on each side because in the adversarial system you can always find an expert to, who you can pay to come in and, and um, reach reach a conclusion that is in keeping with your you, you know with the prosecution's or the defense's outlook on the case and that's what happened here they had people with impressive resumes on both sides of the of the case and the, and one scientist who who trains fire investigators but also works on exoneration cases uh, said look you know science can't even tell it begin to tell us how this fire started or where it started but it does tell us that the things that were said in the in the original trial were just flat out wrong. Um, they either are wrong because uh, we can disprove that by looking at photographs of the crime scene, or we can simply say uh, it's wrong because they said they were certain about things in which, in which there's no way to know one way or the other. Uh, and and that and one of the main reasons for that is because flashover occurred. And what the experts on the other side says, well, yeah, we agree. They were wrong when they said flashover didn't occur. But if we look at those patterns now, we can still uh, reach a conclusion. And we're and we just know this is this was arson that this was a deliberate fire. Um, and the judge said, well, I'm not going to overturn this trial verdict and grant a new trial because the even the experts today with all the new advances in fire science can't reach a consensus and can't agree so um, it's just not enough for me to upset the jury's findings in this case um, the problem with that is that the again just the justice system is really bad at dealing with science it's terrible at it and, and, and great difficulty in separating junk science from real science or, or lack of science and in this case there was really no scientific backing for for saying hey there can be a huge flash over a fire but i can still figure out what the patterns say with with certainty um there's really no no, no scientific research to support that position and a lot of re, uh, research to support that once flash over occurs uh investigators frequently reach the wrong conclusions you know sort of laboratory tests where where arson experts are asked to go in and and see where the point of origin of a fire is in a in a sort of fake house that's the, they call it a burn cell and then they get in there and they get it wrong you know high percentage of time because um, because flashover confuses the scene so that information was discussed at the, at the habeas corpus hearing which is how you uh, revisit a, a a case in the u.s courts after the 
uh, when when new evidence or false evidence is discovered years later. Um, that information was discussed during the hearing, but it was not persuasive to the to the judge. Um, so his ruling on that is being appealed by the Innocence Project up the next layer of of uh, the justice system. It'll be interesting to see what happens next. Is there a date set forth for that at all? Uh, um, sometime this year. Is, uh, and I don't know if you're aware, or like, how are the Innocence Project going to approach it this time? Are they trying to present uh, new evidence or trying to frame the same thing in a different way? Because I'm not sure how else you can do it differently, right? Yep. Well, I think I think the main thrust would be to say that the trial judge got it wrong, and here's why, and the, and the government, the prosecution will argue, no, he got it right, and here's why, and then the appellate courts will have to decide who's right. But there is an added twist being thrown in. The, uh, there's the possibility that um, the uh, Innocence Project and its arson expert will try to recreate the, the, the fire uh, and to, in, under laboratory conditions, to see if the uh, wh- whose theory about how the fire started and, and spread is correct. Um, the lawyers representing Joanne and their experts, or the prosecution and, and their experts. So they'll <laughs> be able to show which one actually. This is the hope. Which one, which which scenario actually is real, and which one can't, couldn't have happened. In the first trial, if I recall correctly, that the biggest swing of the vote uh, for the guilty plea actually was based on opinions and nothing had nothing to do with the fire part of it. Like a lot of it was the fact that they just didn't like the way she acted or was supposedly acted. Do you think there was like yeah, a big character of, assassination was like kind of part of this? Well, certainly the, the prosecution in her original trial went to great lengths to try to prove what a... Uh, terrible parent she was and the uh that she didn't really want her children um there was there was ambiguous uh, evidence offered because you know, some witnesses people that i've talked to uh thought that she was there was a poor family and the resources were stretched thin and she was a working mom and you know not everything was the way we would like it to be in that household but that you know their pastor and other people said no no, there was no abuse there was no neglect and you know she was a very she was 23 year old uh mother who married at age 17 to a much older man who who did not provide much in the way of child care and who uh you know put it all off on on joanne and she also worked as a waitress and she was stretched beyond her her resources in in some cases that was the defense's portrait um the prosecution's portrait of a, of, a, of a callous mother who didn't even try to rescue her her kids, who told an inconsistent story, which is true, she did, uh, about what she did in the immediate aftermath of the fire. That Because um, later she told people she tried harder to rescue them than she actually did. And, and that made a problem because jurors don't, don't like that when you don't tell the truth. But uh, I think she was incredibly guilty about what happened to her, to her children and some people would argue that her lack of heroism was was so hard to admit for her that she began saying she tried a little harder to get into the house and, and save the kids than she actually did. Uh, the prosecution says, "Look, if you're if you're honest and you're not 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 guilty, you tell the truth. You don't make stuff up." So, I pre- I presented all that information in the, in the book, and it's kind of the reader can decide, just like the jurors decide. There's no doubt that the there was a strong effort to to show her to to be a poor parent they never really were able to come up with a vote motive though for why why i mean there was no financial motive they had had an earlier fire in a, an apartment then lost all their property but nobody was hurt and you'd think if they if joanne was going to set a fire and, and kill her children afterwards the, the first thing she would have done for that second fire was learn the lesson of the first and buy it renter's insurance which is you know really not very expensive and was within their means but they never got insurance arson and insurance fraud kind of go together <laughs> and <laughs> that wasn't present in this case so and they tried hard to uh, figure. portraying her as like a mastermind which you know she definitely didn't come off as that way well and they, oh, so the this is this is the ironic and, and, and scary part of this case and the ambiguous part made it fun and interesting to 
try and construct the story and, and, and tell it as a as an ongoing mystery. The first fire investigator on the on the scene came away with a very preliminary and admitted, you know it wasn't he, he knew he had to check further, but he did not come away thinking that it was a suspicious fire in terms of being set deliberately. He thought it was an electrical fire uh, and that it was acci- likely accidental. After that, there was an anon- not an anonymous but a, an informant phone call uh, from a former friend who had had a falling out with Joanne Parks uh, who told the police, hey, I saw this uh, on the news and Joanne and her husband Ron had been interviewed and, and by on the TV, for the TV news and had um, given some made some statements and Joanne was crying and she was you know, talking about how, how grief stricken they were. This former friend saw that and said, this was no accident. This was murder. And here's why. Because Joanne was a terrible parent. She used to drug her babies with cough medicine so they wouldn't wake her up at night. And um, after that first fire that they had, she remarked to me, "Uh, if only uh, the baby had been in there, we'd be millionaires now. And the police heard that and basically had a freak out. And they called in different um, Washington investigators and said, look, we just got this information uh, that, that puts a whole new spin on this fire. And the new arson investigators briefed on all that information went in and everything they saw that the other arson investigator had kind of passed over seemed suspicious to them. And they decided that there was a sabotaged electrical cord that had been wrapped in cloth and, and cut up and made to start the fire. And they decided that the little boy had been barricaded in the closet and they decided there had been multiple fires set and when there's more than one starting place for a fire uh it's usually arson because you know uh, accidental fires usually have one location to start it so all those things together uh and the idea that this that joanne parks was a bad actor uh, the mastermind behind this fire really took root with that call and I'm sure people hear that and say, God, she's really guilty. What are you even talking about here? Well, it turned out this informant um, had no credibility and had her own ax to grind. And several of the things she said were disproven. And then she just kept changing her story to the point where she was never even called to testify in the case. None of the things she said panned out. They did autopsies of the children. and They specifically looked for the signs that they had had cough medicine or their byproducts of that sort of sleep make you sleepy kind of medicine in their systems. None of them had any of that. None of that turned up in the, in the autopsies. Um, the electrical cord that they initially thought caused the fire was sent to an electrical engineer to, to, so they could like tie up the case 100%. And he said, this, this didn't start the fire. <laughs> so their whole theory about the case suddenly fell apart. Oh, they didn't drug the baby oh she this didn't so this is this is another thing about old school arson investigation they had this practice they called uh, negative corpus and it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a play on the old latin phrase corpus delecti which is the body of evidence uh, in a case well in this case negative corpus means well if there's an absence of evidence of arson namely no more sabotaged electrical cord, she must have started it with a match by hand. <laughs> it's the process of elimination. Oh, there's no other way this fire could have started. She must have just started it with a match or some other way of lighting a fire and did it by hand uh, instead of the sabotaged electrical cord that they had claimed all along caused the fire. And it, uh, that also was a major point of argument um, from the Innocence Project, who says, look, they, their minds were so made up, even when their case falls apart, they just created a new theory. Oh, she did sabotage the electrical cord. It just didn't work and really never could have worked. Um, so she set the fire by hand. Well, what's the evidence of that? There is no evidence, but it's the absence of evidence that we're using to prove that she did it. Yeah, either I'm not making you, I'm not making that up. That yeah, was <laughs> it seemed like no matter it was, it was like a damn if you do and a damn if you don't situation for her. No matter what she did or didn't do, they're going to view it within that prism of of guilt. Well, then it changed again with, during the recent hearing in, in the habeas corpus petition. So uh, at the trial, and the the theory was, oh, the that electrical cord was her attempt to start the fire. Kind of like it would happen 
almost like a time device and it would gradually overload and smolder and catch fire and then she could wait until it really catches and then go run to the neighbors and claim she tried to rescue the kids and that was their initial scenario well then they found out oh no those wires didn't start the the fire but we're pretty sure that's the area where it started because flashover didn't occur that was their incorrect hypothesis so we know it started there even without the wire she must have just right on top of the failed sabotage she must have started it with a match or something and and, and some kind of fuel like newspapers or something (laughs) then at the habeas corpus hearing they said they changed it again Uh, one of the one of the state's experts said oh no she it wasn't that she made a, a device ineptly like they said at the original trial it's that she would masterfully created this uh, this uh, wiring issue so that it would fool the arson investigators at the time into thinking it was an accidental electrical fire and that's because she was so <laughs> so clever she did that it just uh, it didn't work the the uh, the old arson investigators saw through it and realized that that uh, it had to have been started by hand. So they so there was three different evolutions of the evidence and the interpretation of the case. And, and that's why I don't understand uh, the you know the judge's new uh, new the, excuse me the new retrial or from the appeal um, how he could still say no she's still guilty even when the prosecution themselves is changing their you know changing it multiple times i mean shouldn't that, i mean wouldn't that be one of the biggest red flags or am it i just crazy raises, here it certainly <laughs> yeah. raises questions and uh, uh, and i think um, and it just seems like common sense to debate, me. Yeah. but again this what the ineptitude, I don't even mean of this particular judge, but of the justice system itself and in, in how to grapple with expert opinions and from from scientific disciplines, it, it's, it's been fraught with problems for, for decades. Um, and part of the problem is science and the, and the legal system are at odds on how they even think about evidence. You know, that the... the Legal system loves precedent. So once a precedent is established, you know, oh, bite marks work. We can tell, you know, or fire investigators can can testify with great certainty, you know, about what these patterns that no layperson can look at and see anything but devastation out of. They can figure out what the fire. And once that is allowed once in, in a court, it tends to be accepted throughout the system forever. And that's you know, legal precedent is is the the pillar of of that creates consistency in our justice system, and in many ways, that's great. Uh, the problem is when it comes to science. Science hates precedent. Science is all about uh, questioning everything and falsifying things. The only way you can prove a theory correct is if you try to disprove it and and can't. You know, it's like people have been trying to do that um, usually with for religious reasons, they've been trying to falsify evolution for <laughs> for over a, well over a century unsuccessfully. Uh, it's the theory stands up to scientific scrutiny. Um, the problem is that if you establish a precedent that you're going to accept a certain type of evidence, whether it's about fire or fingerprints or anything else, uh, it doesn't get the kind of scrutiny that old scientific ideas need to be subjected to because. Science is constantly redefining and figuring out the universe in new ways. Uh, fire science is a great example of that. So how can uh, we how can we remedy the situation and close that gap between science and judges? You know, there was a famous case of the vaunted, highly respected FBI fingerprint examiners getting totally blowing it with the uh, Madrid train station terrorist bombing back in. 2004, and they matched the fingerprints recovered from a, a case that had a bomb in it that didn't explode at the scene uh, to this lawyer in Portland, Oregon, uh, who uh, who had converted to Islam and represented some people in, in court who had been tied to terrorist causes, and multiple examiners at the FBI matched this, this lawyer to the fingerprints that turned out, according to Interpol, belonged to an, an Algerian terrorist and this Portland attorney it had nothing to do with the crime. And if you look really hard, uh, uh, his fingerprints didn't match. Um, 
what happened is a, something, this phenomenon called cognitive bias had affected the examiners. And it's where uh, you, a forensic examiner hears a lot of extraneous information about the Islamic terrorist network this, or, uh, this lawyer was supposedly tied to. And the other examiners were told that a uh, really respected examiner, fingerprint examiner at the FBI had already matched the two and everybody saw a match to this partial fingerprint and they were wrong because the, afterwards the FBI investigated what had happened and they did a blind test uh, the same examiner is looking at the same fingerprint comparison and none of them saw a match. They didn't know it was the same. It was just like a random test with, with those prints mixed in and they didn't see a match at all. It just shows that um, an argument in favor that forensic examiners who investigate a fire scene or a fingerprint comparison or anything else is just physical evidence shouldn't really know anything else about the case that can influence their judgment. Because that fingerprint case, that Madrid train bombing case is, is the proof that not operating in the blind when you're doing these kinds of scientific comparisons is, is fraught with great problems. It's, it's fraught with the possibility of, of unintentional bias reaching the wrong, you know, leading investigators to reach the wrong conclusion. Well, that kind of extraneous information was, was given to the arson investigators in the Parks case. Do we know if that really led them to, to have, have their judgment affected by cognitive bias? Uh, we don't know. We just know that the possibility exists. And that was argued in this case, too. So one of the things the National Academy of Sciences argues is that we, we use the same kind of blind test that is routinely used elsewhere in science to validate new drugs and, and uh, you know, pretty much every other kind of uh, experiment. Scientific research relies upon these doing things in the blind. Uh, forensic science should be no different. Is what the uh, National Academy of Sciences suggested. Uh, there's a lot of pushback from from that. The uh, uh, the um, you know one side kind of controls all the umpires in the crime scene investigation business. They pretty much all belong to law enforcement and, and work for the cause that's trying to win convictions. And they like to know all the details of the case and what the stakes are and who the suspects are. But again, that runs the risk of a kind of bias, not not intentional bias, but subconscious bias in how how these very subjective comparisons, whether of sometimes of partial fingerprints, sometimes of burn patterns or whatever, how these how these that subjective part of the expert opinion is is reached. Um, and you know, I remember, you know, my one of my high school teachers kept saying, uh, and we were talking about the law, and you, and I just, this is the one thing I remember. He kept saying, if you're ever in trouble with the law and you're in prison, just thank your God for habeas corpus. And now, all these years later, it's kind of circling back. But unfortunately, in the case of you know Joanne Parks, it 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 doesn't matter for her. It's still metaphorically, the jury's still out on that. Mm -hmm. uh, see how it plays out but whatever the outcome in her particular case ends up being the you know the issues it raises in terms of the need to, to ramp up the quality of, of forensics and scientific testimony in these really serious cases is, uh, is is really quite evident and I don't I think in fits and starts that's that is starting to happen you know, you mentioned, we mentioned a little bit the the, the bite mark case. Uh, the only the only reason that Joanne Parks was able to file her new habeas corpus proceeding was because the law had been changed because of this poor guy Bill Richards, this is an innocent man who was in prison for 22 years, and for murdering his wife. He had two hung juries, couldn't convict him, and prosecution tried him a third time. Uh, and this time they had this dentist who said it was a bite mark expert. He said that the Oh yeah, this mark on the wife's body matched this guy's Bill Richards's crooked teeth, and I, I'm, you know, it's like it's a it's a, it's a sure thing. Uh, and the jury in the third trial test uh, convicted him and sentenced him to life. Uh, the judge sentenced him to life in prison. So years later, uh, the Innocence Project, same one in California, uh, <laughs> took on his case and got a, got the court to order a DNA test of, of um, samples of blood uh, found on the murder weapon and the DNA didn't belong to either Richards or his dead wife. 
uh, indicating somebody else was wielding the murder weapon. Uh, uh, and then the uh, dentist in the case admitted that there was really no scientific basis for any of the things he said against um, Bill Richards in terms of the bite mark. And, and basically he recanted his, uh, opinion, his expert opinion. So now there was no case left against Bill Richards. So what do you think happened? Did, did he instantly get released? No, the, the prosecution on the case in San Bernardino County, California, came up with a really clever legal technical argument. They said, well, if you look at California law, uh, an expert opinion can't be considered false evidence. It's just an opinion that happens to be wrong, but it's not actually you know, false evidence the way – uh, you know, a, uh, a fingerprint that was read, uh, in, you know, actually belonged to somebody else uh, could be called false evidence. Um, <laughs> it was a very fine line sort of argument, but the Supreme Court of California said, no, you're right. You know, an opinion's an opinion. It's not factual evidence and therefore it can't be deemed false evidence and so no new trial for you pal they actually sent him back to prison uh, for eight more years until finally the california legislator said well this is messed up and changed the law to say no <laughs> an expert opinion particularly one that was pivotal to the conviction of uh, uh in a capital crime that's since been recanted and disproved we're going to say that could be false evidence uh and so they Legislature changed the law, and that new window of opportunity allowed for the expert opinion in the Parks fire case also to be challenged. But can you imagine eight more years in prison when it was known this man was innocent on a, on a, on a legal technicality? You know, I guess some of the times is that they can't get to these hearings in time because there's so little um, lawyers. But from my understanding, I thought there was enough lawyers in the world. What, what's 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 the excuse for the delay between knowing this innocence and then getting actually out of prison? There seems to be a huge delay between the two. It, it varies. I mean, sometimes, and this was not the case in the Parks case. Uh, it's because the authorities are hiding the evidence from mm -hmm. uh, from the defendant, which is you know, unconstitutional. Obviously, there's there's a legal requirement on police and prosecutors to turn over every, any evidence that would. Uh, tend to exonerate somebody and that's their legal obligation they can't just give over the all the bad stuff that leads to a conviction and hide evidence oh but you know 10 people saw somebody else do it uh, but that kind of hiding of the ball does happen and it creates huge delays huge injustices and it is found out um, there's uh, virtually no mechanism to hold the authorities accountable for doing that i mean you can sue them and get money but it's not like they will personally be punished or sanctioned, or fired, or or anything like that. There's no there's no guarantee that there'll be any repercussions whatsoever. Uh, I don't think most people understand just how how powerful, uh, not only powerful are prosecutors in the American justice system are, but that they have very little accountability other than what they subject themselves to. Unfortunately, I, I would say that <laughs> the vast majority operate honorably and, and try to do see that justice is done but it, it's a system based on the good faith of the people doing it not on any real scrutiny or accountability there's and that's why occasionally there are instances where key information is withheld in other cases people are acting in good faith but they don't don't give credence to alternative explanations that might tend to uh, be be more uh, uh, kindly to to the views of a defendant. Uh, it's an adversary adversarial system, so that the prosecutors and police tend to focus on the information that supports their case and to try and disprove um, facts or testimony or opinion that doesn't support their their vision of what happened. And, and it becomes about winning the case rather than seeing that justice is done. It's very you know we're all human beings, and it's very hard to make that distinction sometimes for, for people who feel passionately about what they do in, in court. So again, all that adds up to years of delays to try and unravel if mistakes were made or if information was hidden or uh, if there's new information out there, new science that 
proves the opposite of what what was thought to be the case 20, 30 years ago. You know, we got both sides saying, no, it was arson. No, it's not arson. And the judge was, you know, he's like, there's no way I could say either way because I'm getting two scientific experts. Do you think that's just going to continue or, or can something really change? Well, uh, I think the uh, there, many of these cases have been resolved uh, at the at the appellate level. Uh, the exonerations have been ordered at that level rather than the trial court level. So it's certainly uh, possible that a different conclusion or uh, different results will be come about. But um, I think I think it's interesting that. That the judge saw, well, the experts can't agree. There's all this uncertainty and controversy. I'm just going to leave things the way they are. I think the Innocence Project is going to argue it's the uncertainty that's the point. It was a, it was an expert who was absolutely certain he was correct, and who told the jury so in no uncertain terms. You know, I think the testimony was if. If what I've told you isn't true, then everything I've ever been taught and everything that every arson investigator has ever been taught is wrong. I mean, you literally testified to that. It was this this level of certainty that one helped win the conviction. It was part of the key information that made uh, it possible to send Joanne Parks to prison in the first place. Now the judge is saying, well, actually, there's a lot of uncertainty about this stuff. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not going to. I'm not, I'm not going to change the verdict, but the Innocence Project is arguing, well, no, if there's uncertainty, you have to set her free because right. <laughs> we can't have confidence in the result. It's two ways of looking at the same same set of information. So how will another court look at that information? It may totally agree with uh, the judge on, on this case. It may say, no, maybe we need to, to have a do-over. So we'll see. Well, hopefully books like Burned and, and journals like you will, will make the difference for, for Joanne and so many others. Um, are you going to continue shining a light on some of the faults in the justice system in cases like this, or you're going to be moving toward a different direction for the next one? No, uh, no I'm going to be doing uh, – well, first of all, I'm going to continue to follow what happens in this case and update the, the book as needed uh, – if needed and, or as needed. Uh, but also my next project is also going to be in the, in the true crime universe and, and get a, uh, another, another murder mystery that raises very different issues. You want to give us a, a hint or, or say to be determined or to be continued. How about we do that on a future That's conversation? That's exactly what I was hoping you were going to say. You're also a psychic. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> or just a true journalist can, that can see the truth behind or see see the foresee the future. Um Edward, thank you really so much for for stopping in and, and talking to us with about, you know, this case or I guess this untrue crime and next time we'll talk about a I guess a true crime. Absolutely. I look forward to it and thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure and and we'll talk soon. And this has been Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Edward Humes talking about his book, Burned, A Story of Murder and the Crime That Wasn't. We'll be right back with the Mind's Eye Wrap-Up. Time for the Mind's Eye Wrap-Up, and that was a pretty sombering look at the case and life of Joanne Parks and the criminal justice system. We'll continue our search for justice on the next episode when Wayne Perry joins us. He is the sister of Deborah DeMello, one of the victims of the New Bedford Highway serial killer, one of the many victims of murders that took place in the spring and summer of 1988. We've explored these murders on a previous episode and how no one has been charged in the 30 years since. Wayne will talk about his sister, Deborah, the police investigation and what his family had to deal with there, and the recent Facebook group page that he started called Shallow Graves, devoted to seeking justice on the behalf of these women. Please stay safe until we meet again. And until then, be well and let well be. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. I'm DJ BJ Turnoff signing off for the Mind's Eye on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio.